I welcome all of you and let's continue on to part three of the kidney. And we had already started talking about GFR, which was glomerular filtration rate. And that's an important concept to make sure that the kidney is functioning correctly, that it's filtering adequate amounts of blood forming urine. So um, let's look at some of those forces that contribute to that GFR. Again, just like we did when we spoke about bulk flow, we're going to have opposing forces that are sort of fighting it out. And the one with the greatest force is the one that's going to win here. So let, let's um, go to that. So in the kidney, you know that you have hydraulic pressure in the capillaries, right? You have blood pressure that's coming in to that from that afferent arterial. And so there's a certain amount of pressure in that arterial. And given the leaky capillaries, it's going to favor filtration, right? It's going to want to burst through those walls and leak out into the Bowman's capsule, right? So that's one pressure that's happening as the blood is coming in to the glomerulus. What other pressures are there? Well, there's colloid osmotic pressure. And that osmotic pressure is the pressure uh, between the blood that's in the capillaries and the fluid that has accumulated in the Bowman's capsule. So as that fluid exits through those leaky capillaries, it's sitting there. And that fluid is going to want to sort of backtrack back in where it came from. And I'll show you pictures in a little bit. Okay, see if you can visualize it and then we'll go back for pictures. The third pressure is um, the pressure itself in the Bowman's capsule. So that fluid now not only has an osmotic pressure, which is different from that inside the blood, but it just has its own pressure of fluid trying to barrel on through. So let's look at those. <clears throat> we start up here with pressure in the blood. So the blood pressure, let's say, is 55 millimeters of mercury. So imagine here the glomerulus in, in the reddish color and then in the lighter color, Bowman's capsule. So the blood pressure is trying to force blood out of those capillaries and come out into the capsule. And let's say, let's give it a, a 55. Now osmotic pressure is going to want to oppose that. Why? Because this blood here full of solute. This is just transparent fluidy stuff that doesn't have many um, the, the, the number of solutes inside the blood is way bigger and there's proteins in there so the solute concentration is larger so we're trying to the osmotic pressure is going to oppose that filtration pressure and let's give it an osmotic pressure of about 30. Okay, it wants to, solutes suck, so it's going to want to come back in again. And then the pressure of the fluid itself, and that's lower of about 13, which is just any kind of fluid is going to exert pressure on its container. And if this is a container, it's going to want to exert pressure to come back. So what we have to do then is take that 55 and subtract the 30 because it's opposing, and subtract another 15. And we're going to end up with a net filtration pressure of about 10 millimeters of mercury. So this is working. This is going to actually exit these capillaries, land in the capsule, and move on to the proximal convoluted tubule. So problems could occur in which the blood pressure was way too low, maybe, and it can't overcome these other pressures. And so we'll look at that. A little later. This is the same concept shown in a different way if you're having trouble um, visualizing this. So afferent arterial blood's coming in. It's blood coming into these capillaries. It has a lot of pressure in that glomerulus. So in red here is the pressure wanting to exit. The two other pressures are the pressures wanting to come back in. The osmotic and the actual pressure of the fluid. And because this is still higher, the blood pressure is still higher, then this fluid is being filtered. We're going to call it filtrate at first. It's not quite urine yet because lots has to happen to it before it actually becomes urine. 
Okay, this is really important, so I really want you to, to know this. <clears throat> it's written out for you a bunch of times. So there it is again. Blood pressure, osmotic pressure, and pressure of the fluid. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'm going to let you read that. We don't need to go over that slide again. So blood pressure changes a lot throughout the day, right? Think about your day, and does your blood pressure go up or down at all? I mean, we try and regulate it, and it is regulated pretty closely, but are there any changes throughout the day? Let's say you release a little adrenaline. You get, think you didn't put, let's see, uh, something in the refrigerator and it's out, or, I don't know, left the stove on. <laughs> adrenaline fires, and uh, your heart rate's going to go up. Exercise, even minor exercise, just running out to a mailbox. So the question then is, hmm, if the blood pressure is changing and we just decided that blood pressure is a major important factor in making filtrate that's going to become urine, then does, the question is, does filtration in the kidney vary along with that? blood pressure change. In other words, when you're exercising, are you making more filtrate and making more urine? So think about that a little bit, and I'll give it away. And the answer is no. That would be very uncomfortable to increase your heart rate through exercise and then make more urine and have to urinate all the way around the track. So GFR is quite constant. It's quite constant. In the event that mean arterial pressure has to be between 80 and 180. So that range is gigantic, right? So it's almost easy to say that, oh, it's completely constant. Gourmet filtration rate is very constant. But there are some extreme cases in which it's not. <clears throat> So we're going to go with it being very constant and now look at some of the extreme conditions. If the blood pressure is way too low, I mean, here you're having an individual who's bleeding out, or way too high, the GFR is going to change so that you can retain water and not die in that condition. So the idea is to conserve fluid if the blood pressure is too low in the excessive bleeding, let's say, and increase urine production if blood pressure is way too high. If something's happening, if that pressure is out of control, then you're going to try and, yes, filter more and get rid of it and bring down that pressure. Okay, but these are, remember, these are extreme cases. Let's look at it in a chart. If you had GFR here on this axis, and mean arterial pressure. Well, mean normal mean arterial pressure is around here. Okay, so look how much higher your blood pressure needs to be before you start making more urine, right? St increase your GFR. Um, in this direction, it's a little less, right? A drop in the blood pressure is going to be remedied more quickly because this could be something like bleeding, excessive bleeding. So you want to be able to correct that quickly and try and keep the blood pressure normal. So the way this happens is there is a myo muscle genic initiate response. Myogenic response meaning that the actual lining of those vessels coming in to the glomerulus can adapt and change vasodilate or vasoconstrict in these events of changing blood pressure. Even when it's tiny blood pressure, they're going to shift blood and put it in other places. Let me show you. So this is yet another diagram of a glomerulus and a Bowman's capsule. Okay, and this is where you're going to manufacture, this is where your GFR is happening, the, the filtration rate. Well, these then are the arterioles 
right? These are incoming arterioles here, which are the ones that are bringing blood into the afferent arterial. Well, this is what it looks like normally, right? This flow to other organs, this is coming into this particular uh, glomerulus, then as an efferent arterial, it all looks pretty good. And you're bringing a certain amount of blood in here of RBF, which is renal blood flow. Okay, now let's go to not normal. If blood pressure were high, so somehow your blood pressure has gone up, not excessively, it's just gone up a little bit. So then what you're going to have to do to regulate that GFR, if pressure's gone up here, then wouldn't it work to increase the resistance in this arterial? Narrow it down, vasoconstrict, let less pressure come in, and voila, you've just regulated your GFR because you have, in the event of an increase in pressure, you've actually diminished the pressure coming in to that glomerulus as a regulatory mechanism. And instead, this flow to other organs in the body, I'm just going to put O for organs, uh, is increased. So you just sort of shunt it off somewhere else and increase the resistance in that efferent arterial. And then notice the efferent arterial. You want to allow the exit. This is kind of like the drain, right? You want that also to open. So you're bringing less in and you're letting more out. And you, in that way, you can regulate that incoming pressure and maintain your GFR constant. This is a condition of when blood pressure was high. Now look at what is the condition, what happens if blood pressure is low? Well, <clears throat> if you're going to have decreased renal blood flow, what you want to do then is then increase right, the efferent arterial and decrease the exiting or efferent arterial and increase the pressure in your little system here. <clears throat> so let's just read this. Increased resistance of efferent arterial decreases the renal blood flow but increases the pressure in the glomerulus. Good. <clears throat> That's when pressure is low, and you, you're able to regulate that and increase it, and you do, so that your GFR, or one's GFR, is not changing considerably throughout the day. <clears throat> so when blood pressure too high, a response of the afferent arterials, the blood pressure, how this happens is that the blood pressure causes stretch, right? If you increase blood pressure in a vessel, if you have a vessel like this, and all of a sudden it bulges because of the increased pressure, right? You just increased the pressure there. Uh, it causes stretch in that, in that muscle lining that arterial. So you have stretch sensitive ion channels that can open. These are mechanically gated channels and these channels can open due to that stretch. And when they do that, it causes a depolarization of those muscle cells. And in the event of depolarizing those muscle cells, that smooth muscle contracts. See? So we started out with stretch, too much, and the outcome here, the result, <coughs> was <coughs> that we brought this back in again. <coughs> those are all the steps. These last slides, so this one last slide, um, is just a review here for you to remember without labels what all these parts are of the nephron. So we're going to start with glomerulus with capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, descending loop of Henle, ascending loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, and collecting duct. And then down here we have urine. 
Good? Okay, good for you to practice. <clears throat> the other one that I wanted to review <clears throat> was what are the locations where filtration happens? Filtration is occurring here. Where is reabsorption happening? Proximal convoluted tubule. Descending loop. Ascending loop. Distal convoluted tubule. And collecting duct. All of them. Secretion. Where was secretion happening? A lot of it is here. In the proximal convoluted tubule. And then... Uh, some, not as much, in the <clears throat> distal convoluted tubule and in the collecting duct. And the last one, which is excretion, is going to just be in one spot. By now, we're going to call it urine. So at this point, I can call it urine. And remember that at this point here, I was just calling it filtrate because so many different things are happening here along it. It's, this fluid here is not going to look like the fluid here. So I'm calling it, and the collecting duct here, I'm sort of towards the end of it, I can dare call it urine, and before, before that, it's just going to be the filtrate. Trade, very hard to write with this, with my mouse. Okay, so that, <clears throat> we're going to stop right there. That is um, the end of section three, and we will move on soon. So thanks for listening. Till the next time. Bye.